Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vaga Maradian here at the Atlantic Council Think Tank in Washington, D.C., where we're attending uh, their U.S. Army Futures Forum, and we have with us Lee Grubbs, who is the uh, director of the United States Army's Training and Doctrine Command's Mad Scientist uh, uh, Initiative. Lee, great seeing you. It's great to see you. I think you like that name, Mad Scientist Initiative. <laughs> I, I do, because uh, it, it really um, it talks about, you know, sort of out-of-the-box thinking is what it, what it connotes. And talk to us about what you guys are trying to achieve and what, it is it, is it, or what falls among the things that you, you guys have already accomplished. So the Mad Scientist program is a training and doctrine uh, program for the United States Army focused on the idea of futuring and connecting the Army to a wide range of experts. Uh, we do really two key things. The first one is uh, we go out and we outreach to academia, industry, other government, other parts of the government, as well as futurists, and uh, we try to understand what are the future possibilities, what are the technologies on the edge, what um, do we understand from crowdsourcing and those aspects of what we do. The second thing we do is we build a network of these subject matter experts so as the Army is thinking about the future, they're thinking about a challenge, an opportunity, that we can rapidly bring expertise to Army problems. And these aren't experts that are in the Army because what we're finding is many of the future opportunities and future challenges, that expertise does not reside in the Army. It requires ability to rapidly go out and bring in a wide, diverse group of people to focus on the nation's challenges and opportunities. Um, some of the most innovative people uh, in the nation have worn the Army uniform, uh, whether it's the accomplishment of gigantic programs like building the atom bomb, pretty much, or even much more subtle weapon-specific inno innovations, when uh, which are some of which were the product of the Army lab system uh, as well. Talk, to, but there's also a conservatism in the Army, um, and a view that you know any sort of focus on technology or reliance on technology is is almost like a false prophet. You know, it, it, talk to us about. The, you know, you were a soldier, you spent 30 years in uniform, uh, you retired as a colonel. Talk to us about the balance, about what are the immutable, unchanging nature of what the Army does. At the same time, the role, the powerful role that technology plays uh, and has always played in, in the service uh, and how it fights. Well, first, uh, the Army is extremely uh, lucky to have many world-class scientists, and as you said, uh, many of the, the great discoveries of the past came out of Army labs, and they continue to do that. Uh, but fundamentally, there's been a change in the last 15 or 20 years, and that is that technology less so derives out of the Department of Defense or things like NASA and enters the commercial world, but is developed commercially, which means that the government needs to figure out how to integrate it back into what we do. And you can see this in a wide range of technologies. Uh, artificial intelligence today would be a great example. Uh, you know, that is being done primarily by the big industry leaders, Facebook, Google, in Silicon Valley. Uh, with the Army having to take what they've learned and apply it to what we do, which is security of the nation. So we're lucky to have that, but the expertise a lot of times exists outward. Now, basically, the Army in itself, part of our culture is we see ourselves as a soldier-centric organization, uh, human-centric. So what this means is, is that we think about technology not from something that we man or equip in all cases, but are ways that are tools that allow us to achieve an end. So this, this puts the soldier very center to what we do, and it's a big part of the Mad Scientist program. Uh, just for example, uh, coming up in March, we'll be doing a bioconvergence conference. Mm -hmm. Biology, be, the center of biology is the soldier. So as artificial intelligence comes on board, or we look at how we might enhance soldiers cognitively, physically, uh, through uh, uh, exoskeletons, through embeddables, through wearables, all those things that we might do, uh, we're going to take a look at that and what that might look like in 2035 or 2050. But center to that is the soldier, how we will enable the soldier to be center to how we see warfare in the future. What are, uh, um, you know, you mentioned artificial intelligence, um, bio is key, nano is key. What are some of the technologies that you think are going to have the most profound effect on uh, not just how the Army fights, but how the Army, that in turn will also shape how the Army thinks about how it fights? Right, well, I, <clears throat> there are four of them that jump out of me in general areas. Uh, the three of them that are extremely connected 
are art of, art of, uh, artificial intelligence, autonomy, and robotics. And, uh, and th just like this is uh, having a huge impact on society about how we're going to drive, how we're going to live, how we're going to work, it's going to have a similar impact on how we're going to fight. So how do we integrate these technologies into what we do? It'll affect everything in the Army. It'll figure about how we force design, what mix of autonomous devices and artificial intelligence enabled devices do we have versus uh, soldiers, how the soldiers interact with those things, what does human machine interface really look like. This is going to have a major impact and it's one of the reasons why we say there's going to be a change in the character of warfare when we look at 2035 to 2050 because this is when these technologies are going to really leave the hype cycle and enter kind of more of a useful enablement uh, to how we fight. The fourth one though I go back to is this idea of biological enhancement. So how do we make the soldier not on the network, but part of the network. How do we make the soldier uh, without overburdening them cognitively and, and physically with weight, how do we make them uh, part of the understanding of what's going on as far as sensors and the way they move and how they interact with uh, autonomous device on the battlefield and how that's networked together. So this is, um, this is a huge um, challenge trying to figure out how to make this work in a way that also doesn't create vulnerabilities. Because each one of these network points you build, from autonomous devices, from artificial intelligence decision support tools, from the soldiers themselves, from the sensors they'll be wearing, from this mesh network, each one of these is going to be a vulnerability that our adversary is going to seek to exploit. From an electronic warfare point of view, from a cyber point of view, uh, you know, each one of these is going to be a way to effectively uh, drive our effectiveness down by disconnecting us from the network that's given us the ability to have a high understanding of what's going on and to quickly act. Do you, um, as, do you think that um, in, in a world that is more technologically leveled, right? I mean, the whole uh, point of the third offset strategy and some of the innovation initiatives that started in the last administration but are being continued by Secretary Mattis uh, and his team at the Pentagon, how, what's the right way to think about the future in a world where everybody has access to the same technologies? Um, and in fact, that some of the nations who are our adversaries like China, who have access to the same technologies, are actually being as innovative, if not more innovative than us. For example, the biggest supercomputer in the world is no longer in the United States, but it's in China. Actually, the top three computers in the world are in China now. So uh, this is a huge change, and it's also tied to the character, changing character of war. It's the democratization of technology. So technology that in the past we would only think would be available to near-peer competitors or peer competitors uh, are going to be available to non-state actors and even super-empowered individuals or organizations. Uh, so this is fundamentally different. Uh, just to give an example, there's going to be an explosion of low-Earth orbit commercial satellites uh, over the next decade. This is, this is happening now. There are going to be thousands of the ability to do this. This is going to be image, imagery and communication capabilities that just 15 years ago we have only considered to be available to ourselves and near-peer competitors, but will be available to non-state actors and super-empowered individuals uh, that want access to this type of information. That's a fundamental, that's a fundamental change about what we're doing. As far as investment decisions, this is an important part of the way, the way we're going forward as well. Uh, because really opportunity and vulnerability really gets tied to investment decisions. Because the decisions on how much to invest in quantum, how much to invest in artificial intelligence, where your investments sit. Uh, the idea that, um, you know, I need to be the early adopter. I need to be the first person there. Who's going to be the first person to hi hypersonic capability? So these investment decisions will create either overmatch or vulnerability. So that's a little bit different as well because of the quick nature, really the, really the parity that's building on these areas. And these four areas I talked about are really key areas where parity is being built between the United States, between China, and between Russia. AI, robotics, autonomy, and bio. Across the four of those, because the three of us, uh, there's real movement forward on all of them. And all of their leadership has talked about these four general areas as being areas they think will give them um, opportunity uh, in the future. Uh, well, let me ask you a, um, a thorny question. We as the United States 
um, don't do human experimentation in the way that some other nations historically have. Uh, I was talking to a friend of mine about man-machine interface, uh, and he uh, he's a retired army, very good friend of mine, strategic thinker, and he was, you know, the point he made to me is, people have got to stop talking about it because the Chinese are actually literally integrating man and machine in a way because of, you know, I, I don't know the details of it, but he was sort of, you would be astonished to know how some of their experiments are going on this. So what are the challenges that presents the United States, whether it's on performance enhancing, whether it's genetics, or anything that we as Americans would look at and say, boy, you know, those are red lines and we won't cross them, whereas other nations may have less of a problem literally embedding in a USB plug in the back of your head to be able to do something. Talk to us a little bit about the challenge associated with that. Well, in the Mad Scientist program, we've had a, uh, we've done a, a study on this idea of a, a symmetry of ethics, asymmetry of ethics. And it's the idea that a, our country would make a decision based on our own ethics and morals and, and, uh, and norms, standards, that another country might choose a different way to go about this. And then what kind of vulnerability does that build into the force in the, in the future? So there are current um, examples. One would be clustered munitions. As a nation, we've decided we're not going to use clustered munitions. There are other nations that haven't made that decision. So what's the impact? What's the vulnerability? It might only be tactical. It might not in other cases. So the real question is, it, whatever we choose and whatever potential adversaries choose, we have to assess what kind of vulnerability are we building into that. Because first and foremost, we have to be, uh, we have to be honest to our our ethics. But there's an asymmetry of ethics. It's definitely going to be something that has to be looked at uh, in the future. Now, with the idea of cognitive enhancement and physical enhancements, there might be things that actually move norms. So mm -hmm. here's an example. We're an aging population. My parents, your parents, uh, us, our children are going to want us to be able to be alone, not need to be in homes or things like that for much longer. It just costs too much money to be to uh, be cared for that way. So there's a there's a lot of science going on right now to how do you help cognitive enhancement with somebody that might have early onset Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. or the person that has a light exoskeleton suit to give them mobility so they don't fall and break a hip, so so that they're able to live a more longer not a longer life but quality of life longer. So as these things norm. Mm -hmm. And if we discover that the medicine that we're giving to somebody with early onset Alzheimer's helps them, what if we learn that it also helps Lee remember names a little bit better and there's no negative impact to it? Well, hey, 55 year old Lee Grubbs, I want, I want some of that. So the question is, you know, our society also might move over time. And what we consider to be ethics and standards today as far as the use of pharmaceuticals for cognitive enhancement might not be that way in 20 years. And elderly care might be the driver that goes there. And that's just one, you know, that's one of the things we do at Mad Scientist. We try to think about the full range of what could move things different ways and, and what does it mean to this idea of asymmetry of ethics. What are the black swans that you're tracking? Because in, in your business, enough foresight into the future could be both extremely good uh, or by positively terrifying, depending on how you look at it. So what are some of the black swans that, that you think could be out there that we need to be paying attention to? So this, so this is also something we don't really think about black swans that much. And the reason why is in the original book about black swans, it was impossible to predict black swans. That was, that was, that's the premise. So Frank Hoffman at the National Defense University came up with this idea of pink flamingos, which I think is a much better thing to think about. Pink flamingos are those things that you're, you're pretty sure are going to happen. They're on the time horizon. And they're also the things that your organization is struggling to align themselves organizationally to be prepared for. So an idea of um, hypersonic capability. Okay, we're, we're, pretty, you know, we're pretty confident. There's a lot of talk about hypersonic capability. There are multiple countries trying to seek it out, that it's going to happen. So this is a pink flamingo. This isn't a black swan. So when the first hypersonic missile comes around, what does that mean to U.S. missile defense? What does it mean to a whole range of things about the timeliness that we have in decision making? So these are pink flamingos. And there are a bunch of different pink flamingos. And we tend to focus more on uh, what, we th what we think we know and the things that our organization needs to align to, rather than try to think about things 
that we don't know and really working hard to figure that out. Because we just think that black swans is just, the whole idea is that you, you cannot predict a black swan. Um, and, it's, and, and that's a good place as any to stop, uh, given that uh, Dr. Frank Hoffman is also the originator of the concept and the term hybrid uh, war. Lee, thanks very much for spending time with us. We really appreciate it. And, and if you guys have anything interesting you guys are working on, give us a call. We'd love to have you back on. Thank you.